We're continuing to invest in the business. There's a lot of extraordinary upside in the business. And then we do make it, uh, investments and acquisitions, uh, so do all of our peers. There's a lot that's exciting going on in the world. And so we're looking across the board, starts within the business, then it goes to investments and acquisitions, then obviously return of capital through a not inconsequential share repurchase program. You can watch the full conversation with Alphabet President Ruth Porat tonight on the David Rubenstein Show, peer-to-peer -peer conversations. I'm pleased to say that David's catching up with us to talk about that chat right now. David, good morning to you. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Great to catch up with you. Ruth Porat, storied career, not just on the West Coast and Silicon Valley, but also on Wall Street, and has faced existential crises in the past with Morgan Stanley, at the right at the epicenter of the financial crisis. I'm wondering from your conversation, did you get the sense that Alphabet feels like they're facing one of those right now? No, I mean, she's lived through the crisis of 07, 08 with Morgan Stanley, where Morgan Stanley came very close to having to file for bankruptcy, and they obviously survived. As the CFO, she did a great job there and was recruited away to be the CFO of, uh, of now Alphabet, then Google. And now she's been promoted to be the president and chief investment officer. So she's got the highest job she could probably get as a non-engineer at that company. And she's got a more than $100 billion cash pile to invest. So she's very popular with Wall Street people, for sure. It feels like the AI is the threat, potentially the existential threat to the core business of Alphabet. Did she say much about that, David? We did talk about it. Uh, I wouldn't say she thinks it's a threat. She would say it's an opportunity because while Microsoft has gotten a lot of attention and obviously very strong in AI, Google has a lot of uh, AI capabilities as well. And when they start putting that on their platform, I suspect it will really enhance the use of Google. I want to talk about sherry purchases. This morning, yeah. Uber uh, announced a $7 billion inaugural sherry purchase. We've seen incredible amounts of sherry purchases and dividends, Meta with their new uh, dividend. Is this the new playbook that essentially it's not about pie in the sky and it's not about the metaverse and it's not about that? It's just cold, hard cash? Well, it's hard to make a lot of acquisitions these days with cash because the Justice Department, the FTC, are, don't seem to be approving very many things of any consequence, so that's a factor. Secondly, these companies are making a lot of cash, and there's no doubt that the, while there's a tax on, on share repurchases, it's a modest tax, relatively speaking. So people that want to do share repurchases are going to do them despite the 1% tax that occurs now. So I think if you've got a lot of cash, giving it back to your shareholders is good. It's hard to make acquisitions of size these days without having regulatory problems. So is that the reason why you think you're going to see this a whole lot more? I suspect we'll see more of it for the time being. Now, um, if you have a lot of cash, uh, regulators sometimes don't like you to um, do share buybacks, and that's why the Congress imposed the tax, but they don't like you to make acquisitions either. So it's, you know, catch is a, it's a difficult situation. Do you expect the cash to be deployed into sports teams more frequently? Um, I suspect probably not. <laughs> that's exactly uh, the question I was going to ask. <laughs> I, I think uh, uh, individuals, but to be honest, uh, publicly traded companies don't yet typically buy sports teams, at least in the United States, they do overseas. So it's mostly wealthy entrepreneurs or other people who have the cash to do that. And I suspect you'll see more of it because the values of sports teams has risen dramatically in the last couple of years. When the New York Yankees were bought by George Steinbrenner, I think it was in the 1970s, he paid roughly, I think, $8 million for the team. That's amazing. Eight, $8 million. Um, you know, when the Baltimore Orioles <laughs> were bought and to, brought to Baltimore in 1954, they were paid, the purchase price was uh, $2.2 million. $2.2 million. So, um, these teams tend to go up in value. They don't tend to go down. There is a feeling here that maybe we've reached a saturation point with the competition for sports TV rights and that potentially we might have reached a limit for how much a franchise is worth. Would you push back against that in some way? Well, people always say this is the highest price anybody will ever pay for anything and the world keeps going on because we have inflation and so forth. Uh, clearly, there's only a limited number of people that can watch a game or how many people you have on the face of the earth. Everybody can't watch every game. And even so, um, these prices have gone up. So, for example, take the most recent uh, Super Bowl game. More people apparently watched that than watched any television event since the moon landing uh, in 1969. So um, there are a lot of people out there who like to watch sports. There's nothing... Uh, wrong with it. And, do they uh, like American football or do they like sports? Because in American football has absolutely dominated TV ratings. What can baseball yes. do to get there? Well, there are two different types of things. More people go to Major League Baseball games every year to go to NFL football games, obviously the more games, but uh, you have a lot of people showing up at the games. Uh, and the TV rights, though, there's no doubt that NFL dominates television. If the top 
45, top, top 50 shows you know, on television history in the United States, probably 40 of them are, or 45 or so are uh, NFL games of one type or another. It's just unbelievable. If someone's tuning in and they don't know why we're talking about this, it's because uh, you have invested in the Baltimore Orioles, uh, almost $2 billion. I thought investment. we were dancing around that. Yeah, Lisa. well, I, I'm just going to go directly <laughs> at it. I mean, well, what is this? This is well. ridiculous. But I want to ask you, why? Is it a sort of nostalgia play? Is it because of the investment for, for, for the valuation? Uh, a couple of things. First, I am from Baltimore, and I grew up uh, rooting for the Baltimore Orioles. And I should point out that the league has not approved me yet. I have to be approved by the ownership committee. So a deal has been announced between uh, the current owner and a group that I put together, but it's not technically approved. Hopefully it'll be approved at some point in the not-too-distant future. But uh, for the time being, I would say I, I, I'm interested in it because I want to give back to my hometown. Um, I enjoy sports. Um, I think it's a, a very good investment opportunity, so for all those reasons. What's the courtship like? Do you have to go to them and explain kind of what you would do, or do you have to kind of give them a sense of your commitment to Baltimore? I'm just curious about the process of this type of thing. Well, they asked if I would go on uh, surveillance and talk about it, and I said <laughs> I would. So that was the main reason that they, they agreed to let me do it. Um, I actually think that you know, anybody that sells a sports franchise doesn't want to sell it to somebody who's going to ruin the franchise. So you have to say why you think you can make it even better than somebody's already had it, uh, did with it. So I think we can do a good job with it. But we're going to bring back a lot of people that are well known in Baltimore. Um, Cal Ripken is a good example. We'll be investing with us and other things. So I think we can assemble a good group of people who care about Baltimore. Uh, and one of those people who care about Baltimore is a guy named Mike Bloomberg. OK, I've heard of him. I've heard of him, too. I didn't know he was an Orioles supporter. Mike though. is a graduate of Johns Hopkins and I think has given more money to Johns Hopkins than any single individual in the history of our country has given to any other one university. That is true. So I think roughly $5 billion. I don't know exactly, but something like that. So he cares about Baltimore and um, is happy to participate in this as well. But possibly the Red Sox a little bit more <laughs> than maybe the Orioles. Maybe. I thought Boston sports was the thing for Mike. Well, I'm going to drop by the desk after this and make sure I'm not getting in trouble. Well, Mike is probably watching, but uh, I think his main sport might be golf, but uh, he does like baseball. That is true as well. Can we just finish? Just a final yes, word. Okay. International investment in American sports. We've seen a lot of it go the other way. Are you expecting more international investment in American sports? Are we going to open the doors to the Saudis, for instance? There's a certain xenophobia in the United States with certain parts of the world investing here. So I think if if I think Saudi investors, Chinese investors, Russian investors would raise eyebrows, to be honest. So I think also the American sports tend not to be as global in that sense. So uh, English Premier League is a global sport. American baseball, American football tends to be more of a uh, American sport. Now, NBA basketball is becoming more global, but I think you're more likely to find American entrepreneurs buying these teams than global uh, companies or firm, firms. Interesting. Right now, uh, only one NBA team has a sovereign wealth team, a sovereign wealth fund investing with it. Uh, sovereign wealth funds have not been approved by uh, the, the uh, NFL or the, uh, or the uh, uh, Major League Baseball. So at some point, sovereign wealth funds will probably be investing, but right now they're generally not.